see everyone. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Hebrews, chapter 11. We're also are going to spend a little time in the book of Exodus, chapters 1 and 2. You might want to turn to both places, Hebrews 11 and Exodus chapter 1. I just want to read uh, just a few verses in Hebrews uh, chapter 11. talking about Moses this morning, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. And as we read, I want you to notice words about affliction, words about affliction, Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents, because they saw he was a proper child. The word proper means he was beautiful. He was not only beautiful to God, he was beautiful to his parents. Both his parents and God. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment. That's an expression of affliction. We're going to deal with that in a minute. They were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, he was about 40 years old, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Mm -hmm. Choosing rather to suffer what? To suffer affliction. affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, that's affliction. Greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. We had respect under the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. That's more affliction. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. That's by our medicine. Hearts together in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we're thankful, Lord, for these dear people. We know among us there are hearts that are burdens and hearts that are grieving, and there are in our minds oftentimes anxieties and worries, and we're going through affl afflictions and trials. And yet we know that we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. We're thankful, Lord, that we have in our hands your holy word. The Bible says the entrance of thy word giveth light. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. We're thankful, Lord, this morning that we have this place to meet, and we pray, Lord, that you knit our hearts uh, together in unity as we focus on the person and work of Christ and on this ancient patriarch, a man who lived by faith, Moses. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. The Bible tells us in, in the second book of Moses, in the book of Exodus, chapter 1, verse 5, that all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls. <clears throat> that was a starting group. But what happened? It says in Exodus chapter 1 and verse 6, And Joseph died and all his brethren and all that generation, and the children of Israel were fruitful. You know what that means? They mean they had, they had a bunch of kids. 9, 10, 11, 12, more. And increased abundantly and multiplied and wax exceedingly Mighty. And the land was filled with them. That's not hyperbole. 
That's not an exaggeration. They would just, you know, they would just everywhere. Verse 8. And there rose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Not only did he not know Joseph, he did not know Joseph's God. He didn't know the one true God, Yahweh. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and they come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built, and we're not going to read all the rest, but verse 12 says, they afflicted them, and they continue, verse 12, and to multiply and grow, and they were, they were grieved because of the children of Israel. You know, people still are grieved over the children of Israel, aren't they? They are God's people. They've been given the land. They are the only nation in the world that are specifically chosen by God. They are God's people. That's where we got our Bible. Amen? That's where we got our Savior. So we're going to think a little bit about that later on. But notice, notice his response. And we're not going to read this, but it's in, it's in chapter 1. But what was his response? What was Pharaoh's response to this multiplication of these people and that they're growing and they're, they're seemingly everywhere? Number one in Exodus chapter one in verse 16, uh, the plan was to be, for the little boys to be murdered by the midwives. They were to be murdered by the midwives. And secondly, that didn't, that didn't work so well, right? What was the excuse? Well, those Jewish ladies, that by the time we show up, by the time the midwife shows up, the babies are right. So what do you do then? So then the plan B, in Exodus chapter 1, verse 22, is throw them in the, in the Nile River. Do you think that's affliction? Do you think there's any anti-Semitism in Egypt during those days? Have, have the mothers, the, the midwives, kill them with the parents right there, the relatives right there, or if that doesn't work, then throw them in the river. So that's, that's a response. So what it, that's Pharaoh's response, but what, what was Moses' parents' response <coughs> to all of this? Again, back in Hebrews chapter 11, let's notice, if you will, verse 23. By faith, everything's by faith. This whole passage is almost like a song, by faith and through faith, and by faith and through faith, you can almost read it, all right? By faith and through faith. So it says in verse 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents. If you raise little ones, some of them are not quiet, right? Some are quiet, and that's, that's a real blessing, amen? <laughs> We had two kids and two screamers. Okay? It went on, uh, well, Brendan knows the exact time, but it went on for months and months. Years? Years. Okay. <laughs> Worse than I had remembered. Can you imagine what it was like to try to hide little Moses for three months? But again, notice the context of verse 30. He was here three months in his parents, and and why, why did they hide him? Well, he was good looking. He was handsome. It's interesting, the book of Acts, in the original, it has a sense of he was not only beautiful to his parents, but, but he was beautiful to God. See, God's involved. God's observing. God's superintending. God's in control. Aren't you glad God's in control? No one else is around here. So God is superintending. These people are good and godly people. They're living by faith. Uh, they know that he is a handsome child, a charming child, a well-formed child, a child that was to be given to God. Really a miraculous child in the sense of preservation and protection. Can you imagine, ladies? 
Next, we put your little baby in a little basket, homemade basket, not approved by some government agency to, 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 to keep your baby out of the water, and you let the baby go. Did that take some faith? And it was both of them, right? She wasn't bleeding. No, 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 it's not a good idea. No, 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 no. We, we don't need to pray about this. My baby doesn't go in the water. So the beautiful child, the child committed to God, and they, notice verse 20, they were not afraid. Nothing was going to terrify them. You see the end of verse 23? And they were not afraid of the king's commandment. What was the king's commandment? Kill, to be killed by the midwives, plan B, throw them in the river. Pretty, pretty good plan, right? The Nazis had their ovens, the Egyptians had their midwives, and, and I suspect that some kids were thrown in the river. So we have Pharaoh's response to God's blessing, and then we have parents. They are an example, aren't they? They are an example of what it means to trust God in your extremities. What does it mean to trust God in your afflictions? What does it mean to trust God in your persecutions? What does it mean to trust God in your trials, in your difficulties, in your heartaches, in your heart? What does it mean? It means to trust Him even if the king is saying, kill him, right? You trust Him anyway because they knew, I don't know how they knew, but I'm convinced that they knew that this, this proper child, this beautiful child, this handsome child, this well-formed child was God's child. And you can't destroy the leader of a nation, right? Who would have led them out of Egypt? It had to be one person, right? Didn't have the second option, the third option. It had to be God. So what we have is we have, in this passage, we have an illustration of faith. What does it mean by faith is you? Listen, you're not afraid of the government. You're not afraid of the terrorists. You're not afraid of the situation. You're not afraid of the circumstances. You're going to live by faith. You're going to see that this is a proper child, a proper child not only to them, but also to God. And they were, listen, they were not afraid. They were not terrified. They would not allow the government to terrorize them into not doing God's will. But not only that, we have Moses as an example of faith. In verses 24 through 27, he, he would not conform. He would not conform. Notice, if you will, in verse 24, there's something that he refused to do. By faith, Moses, when he was come to, to years, he was about 40 years old, he what did he do? He refused. He said, no, I won't. Now, how was he reared? Was he not reared in the lap of luxury? Did he have every benefit? The palace, the best of food. The, it, I, I imagine that, that he... He graduated from the University of Egypt, don't you? Got the, he probably got a graduate degree in political science. He was going to, what was the family business? Leadership. leadership, the leadership of a great nation, a powerful nation that subjugated God's people for many years. I mean, he, he grew up in the lap of luxury. Last week I was watching a documentary on the on the Kennedys. It was in color, okay? It's pretty impressive. And they're on a boat, and there's all, you know, there's President Kennedy and Mrs. Kennedy, and then there's then there's the kids, you know, John John and Carolyn. Carolyn's my age, okay? Then and then and now. And it was in color and I she had a pink little dress on and I thought, those kids, we didn't know he was going to be killed then, right? But those kids were growing up in privilege and fame, right, and money, and wealth, and, and uh, that's Moses, right? <clears throat> Take your Bibles, if you will, let's just 
Let's just take a minute with this. Notice his refusal. Let's go over to the book of Acts chapter 7. We have a parallel text in the book of Acts <laughs> chapter 7. I'm going to read, read a few verses here. The book of Acts chapter 7. And I'm just going to start right in in verse 17. I know we're in the middle of context, but you'll have to bear with me here. Acts chapter 7 verse 17. When the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham. In other words, there's going to be a time limit. They were going to be in Egypt so long, right? And after that period of time, about 400 years, they were going to, they were going to go into the, the land of promise, right? They were going to go into the land of, of Canaan, which he had promised way back in the book of Genesis to Abraham. They grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred and, and evil entreated our fathers so that they cast out their young children to the end they might not live. This is, this is genocide. This is a, a holocaust before the holocaust uh, by the Nazis. Notice, if you will, verse 20. In which time Moses was born, was exceedingly fair to his parents and God, nourished up in his father's house three months, and when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up. Was that a miracle? Couldn't she have said, oh, daddy just said, kill him, so go ahead, maid, drown him. But her heart was warmed, and she had the, those motherly instincts given to her by Almighty God. And when, and when he was cast out, verse 21, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. Really, it's like she adopted him. Now notice this. Notice verse 22. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty. Now later on he said he couldn't speak. He could speak. How was he mighty? How was he proficient? How was he articulate? In words, his words, and his actions. He was a, he was a tremendous natural well-trained, educated leader. Verse 23. And when he was fully 40 years old, he came into his heart to visit. Who is he visiting? Notice what it says. His brethren. And who are they? They are the children of Israel. He visited them. Let's go right back to our text in the book of Hebrews. Uh, chapter 11. So he refused to be conformed. He left home. He left his sweeter rooms, right? He left his valet. He left his expense account. He left really the only home he knew in a certain sense. Now, I know he was raised by his mother early on. Don't you think he spent some time in the palace? He gave it up. The Bible says that we are not to be conformed to the world around us. The Bible says the word conform there in Romans chapter 12 means one man has described it. Don't let the world squeeze you into its thinking. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Teaching us and denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live. We ought to live soberly, which means sober-minded, seriously thinking, righteously and godly in this present world, and this present world is evil. Nothing in this world is attractive to the godly believer. We're living for another time. We're living for another place. So he made this strong refusal. He refused, listen, he refused to love the world. So right back in our text, in verse 24, Hebrews uh, chapter 11 and verse 24, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He went into his stepmother and essentially said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm disowning you. Isn't that what it says? I'm not going to be your son. I'm going with my people. I'm identifying with my people. They're God's people. I have God's call on my life, and I appreciate all you've done for me. I appreciate the education. I, I, you know, I'm thankful. But 
I'm going to identify with my brothers and sisters, uh, the children, the, the people of God. You see that? Verse 25, we have a refusal, now we have choice. We all have choices. We all have choices. Verse 25. Choosing, that means to take a position. I'm taking a stand. Amen? I'm right here. I'm a born-again believer. I love the Lord. I love the God's people. I love to pray. I love His book. I love godly, spiritual, Christian music. I love good... You say, well, are you just going to sit around and meditate and pray? Well, we probably ought to do that more than we do. And I'm looking at mothers who have little kids, and you probably don't have time to brush your teeth, right? <laughs> mothers with, uh, with little ones and mothers with older ones and teenagers, it's just uh, uh, it's, it's amazing. The pressure and the stress, I understand that. So uh, when your children get grown and you have grandkids, and if unfortunately a little far away, you'll have all the time to do those things that you didn't have time. But I want to stress this. It says, choosing rather to do what? To endure. To endure mistreatment and ill treatment with whom? <laughs> with whom? The people, of God. the people of God. And who are the people of God? Now this applies to all of us, right? This applies to all of us. If you're a born-again believer, you're a person of God. But what's the context? This applies to the Israelis. Right? This is the Jews. Back in Acts chapter 7, when he is identifying with his people, his brethren, the children of Israel, do we not, do we not live, do you think we live in an anti-Semitic world? Have you, have you been, I've sort of been fascinated, fascinated and burdened and distraught by what's going on in Israel. And it seems to me that the Israeli, the Israeli defense forces have two choices. They can kill the terrorists or they can, uh, they can appease the American journalists. What do you think? Do you think they ought to kill the terrorists or do you think they ought to appease the American journalists? Everything is equivalent. Everything is not equivalent. All wars are not sinful. There are some wars that are based that are wrong, but there's such a thing as a just war. If you don't believe me, start reading in Genesis and read all the way to the end, and there's times when God's people were to go to, to war against God's enemies. And the terrorists in Israel today are the enemies of Yahweh. They are enemies. As a matter of fact, you know who the ultimate anti-Semite is? It's the devil himself. You ever wonder why it is? And you don't have to do a lot of this, but if you watch a little, little bit of the news, it's always, we're always showing poor Palestinians. And, and I feel, our hearts break for, for innocent women and children and, and people who are not involved, who would just happen to be born there and live there. And if they're living in poverty, they can't escape. I understand that. We understand that. But what do you do with a bully? Get my second shot, amen? I'm not sure this is in the Bible. But you know how you handle a bully? Punch him right in the nose. You, you see? That's what I would do. Anyway, that's what I did. But you, really, how do you deal with a bully? Stand up. You stand up. And there's bullies everywhere. Some people spend their whole life bullying their, their family members and, and just... They're just bullets. You have to, you have to stand up and, and do right. You know, the Bible says, now this is a rabbit trail. If we don't get back to the text, uh, that's all right, okay? But I want to say this. The Bible says God loved the world, right? God so loved the world. We believe it. You know, who is he talking to? What's the context of John? <coughs> who is he talking to? In John chapter 3, you know what, you know what his name He was talking to Patrick from Northern Ireland. No, no, it's God. Who was he talking to in John 3? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Nicodemus happened to be a rural Jew. In other words, in context, we have a, we have a general application of all, all people, but really, God's love the world. That's the world of Jew and Gentile. He loves Gentiles. 
He loves Jews. Does not the Bible tell us in John chapter 4, verse 22, salvation is of the Irish, right? John 4, 22, you know that verse? Salvation is of the Jews. Boy, we need to remember that in our culture. Remember, remember Esther chapter 3? Remember the book of, I've been reading the book of Esther. Thinking about the book of Esther. Meditating on Esther. Wonderful book. Um, what did Haman try to do? Destroy them all, right? And what did God do to Haman? What did the Nazis try to do? What did God do? What are the terrorists trying to do today? What's God going to do? I believe it. I'm convinced of that. Why do we have so much hatred towards the Jews? We have this terrible hatred because of the devil himself. That's the reason. I'm going to turn to two passages. You can turn with me if you would like. Revelation chapter 20 and Romans chapter 10. Revelation Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 verse 10 says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet die, and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. That, the ultimate anti-Semite is going to be cast not into hell, but into the lake of fire. Therefore, we need to be, we need to be convinced that the gospel is to go to everyone. Everyone without exception. We need to we believe that the gospel should go to everyone. So I want to turn to Romans chapter 10 just for a minute. We're doing a lot of turning and we'll try to get back to our little outline here. Romans chapter 10 verse 10 Romans chapter 10, verse 10, says, but with the heart, and we're kind of concluding some questions that are in prior verses. We have questions, for example, in verse 7 and in verse 6. But notice verse 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made of salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever. Now in a general sense, Whosoever believes is saved. Amen? That's, that's always true. But the whosoever here is more narrowly defined. Who's the whosoever? The whosoever in verse 11 that believes will not be disappointed because of verse 12. What's, what's the no difference there? Between whom? So God, God, even today, Jews who are struggling for their very survival, we want we ought to pray for their peace, right? God will prosper those who pray for the peace of Jerusalem, according to the Psalms. But listen, folks, we need to pray that they would receive their Messiah. He has come. He's going to come again. And I believe that someday the nation will turn, will turn to the Savior and believe. We need to pray for that. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. A lot of churches recite that every week. They don't think about it. The king, the king is coming. He's going to bring his kingdom with him. And that's going to include the nation of Israel and we Gentiles uh, as well. But it says in verse 12, that there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Notice verse 13. But whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you say, how is a Jew saved today? They need to call upon Jesus is their Messiah. They need to receive their Messiah. He is their Messiah. He's our Messiah. We are, are we not the children of Abraham by faith? They are physical children, but they need to be spiritual children. A born-again believer who's a Gentile is a spiritual child, but not, but not a physical child. But, but Abraham is our father. Does not the Bible say? He's a father of us all. We need to believe on the Messiah. We need to believe the Hebrew Scriptures. 
We need to believe the Greek. We need to believe the whole thing. Old Testament and New Testament are all one unit that is dovetailed together. That was a rabbit trail. It ends right here. Okay. What do we have? He's a man that refused. He refuses the world. Refusal. And then he has his proper choice. Let's go right back to our text. In chapter 11 and verse 25. Chapter 11 and verse. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. That's his brethren. That's the children of Israel, Acts chapter 7, verse 23. We ought to look at that. To suffer affliction with the people brought, then to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And that doesn't mean he was acting wild and going to wild parties. That means that refers to the ease, the comfort, the honor, the position, the food, the rest, and the education of the world. He gave up, he gave up good things for Christ. He gave up good things for his people. He gave up good things to, to eventually to wander around the wilderness. His refusal, his choice, and thirdly, very quickly moving to the esteeming the reproach of Christ. So we have a, he's, he's considered it. He's thought about it. He's reckoned on this. And he realizes that defamation is okay. Insults are okay. Ridicules, ridicule is okay. For the Lord. That is what it says. Esteeming the reproach of Christ. You ever had someone come up to you and say, Do you take the Bible literally? Now that's a trick question. We don't take Proverbs literally. That's Hebrew poetry, right? There's history in the Bible. There's poetry in the Bible. Right? There's biographical, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that's, who's, who are they talking about? It's talking about Christ. There's didactic teaching, there's apocalyptic, right? Think of the book of Daniel, think of the book of Revelation, pictures, beast out of the earth, right? Beast out of the sea. There's all different types of literature in the Bible. That includes literal, that, in, that includes parables, right? A soil and not for soul, speaking of the gospel. That's not talking about a literal farmer. That's talking about the spreading of the seed of the gospel. We take the Bible in all those <coughs> legitimate ways, including literal. And by the way, we always approach the Bible literally first, and then if it's not literal, we have to analyze that differently. That was an aside. So we have this, this estimation. We believe the Bible, believe, believe the word. And very quickly, the end of verse 26 and 27, we have a forward look. He refused. He chose. He made an estimation. The reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Do you think there are any treasures in Egypt? For he had respect. The word respect in the original language literally means preposition away from and the root, the main word means to see. Now watch, watch look at it, watch it. Away from, to see. He turned away from wealth. He turned away from prestige. He turned away from his step-parents, right? He turned away from a great career as a leader of, the, of at that time, a great nation. He turned away, and he looked, he looked to the Lord. By faith. And what did he become for the next 40 years? Do you remember? Do you think he ever longed for the, the leeks and garlics and nice robes and intellectual discussions? Did he ever long for that? The pals? Notice what it says. He had respect. He looked away from under the recompense of the reward. And notice the last by faith. We're almost done. By faith, he forsook Egypt. He took a stand. He believed the Bible. He believed the promises. He believed God. Not fearing the wrath of the king. You can't live by faith and simultaneously live a life of anxiety, doubt, worry, care, and unbelief. You, you, can't, you can't do it. Don't try it at home. You can't do it. 
You can live by fear, or you can live by faith. It says, by faith, he was in Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured. He endured! Amen? He kept going. He persevered. He looked at Jesus. He looked at the Lord. He held out. He endured. Listen, he was strong. Amen? He was strong. Even in his weaknesses. Even in his failings. Even in, with his old disposition, sinful nature. As seeing him who is invisible. Amen? I trust that we will live. When you approach this afternoon and tomorrow and your decisions and what you deal with, just remember Moses' parents. Amen? Amen. And remember Moses. Those people believe the promises and look to the Lord.